On this episode of the Ask Mike Reynolds Show, we talk about the new internal brace repair procedure for Tommy John injuries and who would be a good candidate for this procedure. The Ask Mike Reynolds Show. Helping people feel better, move better, and perform better. Before we get to the podcast, I wanted to make sure you knew about my free online course on the introduction to performance therapy and training. If you want to learn how to get started optimizing and enhancing performance, this is the course for you. Head to MikeReynolds.com slash performance to sign up today. Welcome back, everybody, to the latest episode of the Ask Mike Reynolds Show. We're here answering your questions. Uh, we have uh, an amazing group of PT strength coaches from Champion PT and Performance up in Boston here answering your questions. Let's see, we have Dwesh Podell, Mike Scaduto, Jonah Monlock, Dan Pope, Dave Tilly, Lisa Lowe, and Lenny Macrina here for you today from the crew. Lenny, who do we have for students today? We have some amazing students, as I like to say, because they are amazing. They make me so happy. Um, we have Nancy Kuhn from Mary Baldwin University. Um, Nancy played uh, lacrosse in high school. Um, and we have um, Courtney Camborellis from Duville uh, University in Buffalo. Fun fact about Duville, it was named after the Grey Nuns, a Catholic nun foundation um, that was nicknamed the Grey Nuns. Marguerite Duville was her name who founded the Grey Nuns. Her husband was a bootlegger, Francois Duville, who later died and she maintained the name Duville. That Isn't felt like a Wikipedia <laughs> slam poetry. <laughs> did, did, did you just do the chat AI thing? Yeah, you, you were reading like a robot. <laughs> yeah. can, you, can you do that again, but in the form of a haiku? I prefer a haiku. <laughs> That was is this what you're doing the effect. whole last episode? Is this the whole last episode that you weren't paying attention and you were just <laughs> looking that up? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's Jonah a good did such one. a great felt- job. Jonah did a great job with the fourth place that <laughs> I, I don't just even know the topic of last episode. You're on chat. <laughs> <laughs> Lenny, you still amazing. remember the history of Mary Baldwin University? No, that's all right, right. We, could, we could talk about this. Uh, all right, talk podcast, about this <laughs> exactly. It's like inside voice thing. Like this is we can we can talk about this some other time. But anyway, all right. Who, Nancy, what do we have for a question today, Nancy? All right. So Tom from Arizona. I'm starting to see more of the UCL repair with internal brace procedure in baseball pitchers. I want to be able to know when to recommend this for my patients over the traditional Tommy John procedure. How do the surgeons decide which procedure to perform? Ah, good one, Nancy. I like the Arizona accent that you added this time, too. I'm just kidding. I don't know. Is there an Arizona accent? <laughs> but uh, no, <laughs> that, that was amazing. But uh, yeah, that's a great question. So we're definitely starting to see this new procedure or newer procedure, right? Using an internal brace to help repair a Tommy John ligament. Um, and we're talking about this in, in elbow, right? Um, but, you know, this is being applied to other ligaments elsewhere in the body, too. I mean, but I haven't seen a ton of these yet, like in other body parts, but we just see so much baseball. Um, but we are definitely seeing it more. And I like this question is, like, how do you how do you know, you know, which one to perform? Um, you know, there's there's a couple of buckets to talk about here is one is obviously the patient's desires. Right. But the other one here, too, is and I'll start the episode off with this and then maybe we'll kick it off to Lenny for some more details. But I do know that our friends that do this procedure, right, the surgeons that do this procedure, they uh, they get the patients to consent for both procedures before the surgery. So you're agreeing to either of them and they do make a decision oftentimes intraoperatively on whether or not you are a candidate to do this internal embrace. Um, And they do get you to consent that if they don't like the ligament, for example, the way it looks, that they'll perform a traditional Tommy John reconstruction, not a repair, right? So, um, you know, I, I will say that the surgeons prep everybody for that. But Len, um, and if, if you want to know more, I'll kind of talk about this now, but I did a great um, podcast on my other podcast, the Sport Physical Therapy Podcast with Dr. Jeff Dugas from Birmingham, Alabama. Um, and he's one of the ones that really started pushing this a little bit more. You should go check out that podcast episode too. But Len, 
But uh, so let's start it off with this. Uh, who's a candidate for this and why? Why don't we start with that? And I'll give you just an open-ended thing to run with. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So I think everybody starts <laughs> off as a candidate, right? You have medial elbow pain. Yeah, all right, fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you come and they determine you have a UCL sprain. Um, and then it's it, it, the MRI shows something going on. So now you're a candidate. And now it's intraoperatively. Um, we work a lot with uh, Dr. Chris Ahmad, who's the Yankees team doctor in New York City. And so it's usually, uh, and previously Luco at MGH in Boston, and now Matt Liebman. Um, so we have a bunch of surgeons that we have good relationships with, including Jeff Dugas. So we get all this information from them. So it's usually an intraoperative thing that they are um, deciding kind of like on the fly. And I feel like it's evolving. I feel like every time I, I think I understand when they're going to do an internal brace, it's evolved into we're just going to do an internal brace as a hybrid now, which means they're going to reconstruct it and do the internal brace. But previously it was, is it a tear on the, either the proximal or distal end, not a mid-substance tear? Mid-substance tears cannot heal on their own. You can't sew the fibers of the UCL back together and then put a piece of the fiber tape or the internal brace on top of that. So they try to, um, and it just doesn't work well. But if it's a proximal or a distal tear, so meaning on the sublime tubercle distally or on the medial epicondyle proximally, they can fix that, put that back down to the bone and then put the internal brace uh, on top of that. But a lot of doctors are saying, you know what? But wait, there's more. We can do better. We can reconstruct it with your hamstring or palmaris, uh, palmaris graft, and do the internal brace on top of that, along with repairing the ligament first. So you have a repair of the ligament that was torn, your native ligament. They take your palmaris or hamstring and they put the internal brace on top of this. So now you have this sandwich of delicious tissue that is going to protect that medial elbow, uh, at which point you get back to throwing. But I think in the doctors that are still, which is a good chunk of them, still doing just an internal brace, it's more of a off the bone kind of tear versus a mid substance tear. I like that, and and I think that's a great first place to start right there. Is if it's torn in the middle, right, an inter substance tear, it's you, you can't just repair it; you have to reconstruct it. Um, you know, the the hybrid procedure that Lenny alluded to, um, you know, I I think that changes the conversation. Um, you know, it, it, that turns it back into a traditional Tommy John. You just added right. some internal brace on top of it. So all right. the benefits of the internal brace are kind of out the window at that point. You're not going to be able to get back faster. Um, you know, it, it, that's something that I think some surgeons are trying. Um, I'm not sure if that's going to be the future or not. I don't know. I mean, we'll, yeah, we'll see. You know, um, you know, we, we have some that we've seen, right. Um, they seem to be a little tighter at first. I talked to one of the surgeons, Keith Meister in, in Texas, that that's doing a lot of these. And I said, yeah, you know, he's really tight. You know, his, his elbow feels really tight. The first one I saw and he's like, oh yeah, yeah. They're super tight. Good. I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> great. great. <laughs> you know, but, but I was like, oh, all right. Okay. So that's, that's the point. So, um, you know, it's helpful to understand that, but I like that. That's uh intra substance tear. Um, Tommy John's are evolved, right? So when I first started, these were like 30, 30 year olds plus that had chronic crappy like like 10 uh, uh ligaments right that over time just like torn you had to have like this big reconstruction i think what's happening now is we're seeing a lot of younger people that have insufficiency and it's not as uh degenerative maybe of a ligament right the ligament's not completely trash um so i think there's more people that might be candidates to do this internal brace um, maybe we'll throw this to, to Mike a little bit. Cause I know Mike sees a lot about this too. And, you know, I want to hear your thoughts in general, but like, I, how much of this is an age thing? You know, I mean, you know, is this a younger person procedure because their ligaments not as messed up? Like, I don't know. Are, are we, you know, Lenny talked about the status of the ligament, but what about the patient themselves? Like when does that start to factor into who's a good candidate? Um, yeah, I would say I've seen it. I've seen it both ways. I've seen this performed in younger people um, with, you know, potentially better quality ligament tissue, although they have a, a UCL sprain, it's not as degenerative in nature. Um, and then I think I see it as well in, in college later, later on in college students like juniors and seniors that want to play one more season. And this is their chance to get back for that year. Maybe they've already used up a redshirt year. Um, they don't have 12 to 16 months to undergo a full 
uh, UCL reconstruction recovery, and this internal brace enables them to at least have a chance to come back for that final season. So I've actually talked to uh, you know a, a, one of the top doctors, and he he says that people will come in and say, "I don't I don't care what the ligament looks like. This is the patient talking to the surgeon. I don't care what it looks like. I want you to do the internal brace." because I need to come back to play. And I think that's super interesting. And a lot of the conversations right. that I have um, with patients and particularly patients' parents is they're starting to hear about this new procedure. And a lot of people are referring to it as Tommy John light. And I think that's kind of interesting. And they, they think they, they kind of have a choice is to, you know, should we just get the Tommy John light? And as Lenny and, and you discussed, you know, this is a decision that's made intraoperatively. So I think it's, it's, it's interesting to see, um, that there's this option out there that potentially can get people back a little bit faster. There's probably going to be some pressure from parents on kids, surgeons, PTs, maybe to move in that direction to get their kid back a little bit faster. And we'll kind of see how the outcomes change over time uh, as we get more data about it. But so far, it seems like it's, it's been promising in, um, in good outcomes. Yeah, and it'll be interesting. I mean, the whole reason why there's still two procedures is I think that the traditional Tommy John reconstruction is still considered the gold standard, right? And sometimes gold standards just exist because of longevity and uh, a lot of outcomes over time, right? So we know we have something that is reliably successful in a large amount of people. Um, it's, it's, it's not that there's two different options and you have a light one versus the, you know, the, the, the big one, it's more about just as we learn more, hopefully this replaces the gold standard. And we don't know that just yet, but I will say, I don't think anybody on this podcast would disagree either, but we're seeing great outcomes. We, we are not seeing bad outcomes with this internal brace and we've seen it in kids. We've seen it in major league, big leaguers. Uh, we've seen it for revisions. We've seen it for first time surgeries. I mean, we're seeing it and they work. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see down the road how that goes. You know, there's always going to be people that aren't that aren't candidates for this, right? Because their ligament quality is not quite there. So they can't just repair it. But, um, but you know, I think that's interesting. Uh, Dave, did you? what are your thoughts? Or did you have something on this with, with your patient population or even the non-baseball players in general? Obviously, gymnasts are one, but, the, you know, this is more than just baseball players. Yeah. So I guess I have a question for Mike and for Lenny and for anybody else around, like, how does this kind of translate to the non-baseball throw? Because it does make sense, right? Like you have a mid-substance tear and over, I just say an overhead athlete, right? You could think like javelin, you could think also baseball, right? Kind of makes sense that a full repair might be ideal for longevity. Um, and I actually, I see a lot of, uh, we call them Tammy Janes and uh, female gymnasts who fall and they just kind of like <laughs> blow through the ligament, unfortunately, like once, right? Like a hyperextension. And that makes sense. But we also see a lot of repetitive overuse type stuff come up from like, like a distal tear because of hyperextension and impacts. And so that's where my question is. I actually have a uh, high level, level 10 gymnast who has a confirmed distal end sublime tubercle tear. It's not full and it's not a sprain, right? But she, and there's also, we've seen like Olympic weightlifters or people who just over time, you know, get through their UCL and is, is, I guess it's more of your thought is, do you think that's someone who might be a candidate for an internal brace? Cause this girl that I'm thinking of super high level wants to get a scholarship next year, going into junior year. And if we can get her back in whatever the month is three to compete and get a scholarship versus the nine to 12, it might take to skip a whole junior year in a recruiting cycle. Like their doctors, she's six weeks into rehab. She's getting better, but like if it doesn't get better and she still has issues, they're going to talk about surgery. And I think that's a really important conversation of should we try a brace in a non-confirmed, no research person, or is it like just go for the classic, you know, full, full repair and just go because she has like high level traction forces and high level compression forces that are coming for possibly five more years. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah I, I would say I she's definitely a candidate. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, no. I, I, was, I, I was just gonna say, is like the preliminary research is showing that like the the strength of the of the internal brace is, is there. It's not weaker, right? Because that's the first thing I thought of when you said it. it's like, man, this person has to withstand a lot more forces potentially than a baseball player, and and I think it's there. But I don't know. What do you think, Len? I would say if this was my patient, and I would have that in my back pocket, I would not necessarily advertise it. And they may want to just jump into surgery and just skip the rehab altogether and just say, I failed rehab. Um, but in my head, I would know that um, if they are still having symptoms, even instability or pain, and we think it's from that ligament tear, um, that at six, eight, 10 weeks, and we have, we have to now count backwards and when we need to be ready for blah, blah, blah. 
um, that I think this is a viable option for, for a gymnast. Um, and I was skeptical initially um, that, you know, we were going faster with these. I'm like, this isn't native tissue. How are we going faster? How is it stabilizing quicker than a reconstruction? But I think that's the fact that <laughs> it is not our native tissue. It doesn't have to ligamentize and become a ligament from a tendon. I think is a benefit for a lot of people, including a gymnast, a weightlifter, somebody like that, who's not going into a valgus torque all the time, throwing a baseball. I think they can get back a lot faster than a baseball player. And I think there's positive hope for a gymnast and anybody else that you mentioned. Yeah. My concern would just be the traumatic nature of some of these injuries, right? So a gymnast, a wrestler, you know, the traumatic injuries from falls, like cheerleaders that fall on outstretched arms, like those sorts of things. Like there's, there's lots of athletes that get this more traumatically, you know, weightlifters, even right. They, they, um, you know, if it's very traumatic and the ligament itself is beyond repair, I, that's going to always be a problem, right? Because you have to repair the ligament to put an internal brace on it. Right. So but I, oftentimes, I those, oftentimes part. those scar down and heal too. So like the, yeah. the weightlifter who, you know, snatch and something like that gets that hyperextension. Those heal. Wrestler. I've seen a bunch of wrestlers. They heal. They don't need Tommy John because they're not constantly going into valgus. But the somebody, the person who can't heal, didn't scar down well and is still having pain and stability. I think that's a, that definitely a, a good candidate for this. Yeah, especially if you're putting weight on it, right? That's what I go right. back to the right. gymnast, right? You know, the re- wrestler that falls on it once is one big thing. But if your right. activity yeah. is like weight, yeah, yeah, weight yeah. bearing, then, yeah, you're gonna have yeah. It. Um, Dan, what do you think? I was just going to ask a question for you guys because I don't I don't see this quite as much in my population. I, I tend to see I have an, an athlete, as Lenny said, Olympic weightlifter, and he had the decision whether or not to do surgery, and he's gotten back to all his lifts. He's hitting new PRs. He's doing well without it. Um, I don't know if that's the best long-term solution, right? We're, we're always trying to figure out what's best for folks long-term. I think that's a question. Um, one of the things that I kind of pops into my mind, and this is what the surgeon has said, uh, you're going to lose range of motion with this surgery. I guess, um, you know, I think Joan was talking about this prior. We have issues with people losing range of motion at the elbow after these surgeries. For some of these athletes, having symmetrical lockout is is incredibly important, you know? Um, so for an Olympic weightlifter that would potentially lose range of motion going through one of these surgeries, I guess that's in the decision-making process of whether or not they want to go through with that. Because if they're lacking a little bit of lockout, that's going to make it extremely hard for, because lockout is so vital for that sport, you know? Um, And I guess my question for you is, is there a difference with internal brace versus the reconstruction for range of motion for those folks? It shouldn't be. They they should get their motion back. Baseball players don't get their motion back because they didn't have the motion before the surgery because they all have flexion contractions from throwing. But if yeah. you had good motion, you'd have a stiff elbow going into the surgery. You should be fine. Mike Scaduto. I, I, I was just going to say like, a, you know, just generalizing um, the type of, you know, body characteristics that Olympic weightlifter has generally more hypermobile, probably has a good amount of elbow hyperextension, probably wouldn't be super worried about restoring elbow extension after the yeah. internal brace in that, in that type of population, but probably comes down to the specific person. Right. Thanks, yeah, I, w- when they're doing the surgery, like they bring it through full range of motion, right, to assure that they didn't over tighten it. So, um, you know, they it shouldn't limit the range of motion. It's not designed to limit the range of motion, um, and it shouldn't. But yeah, poor rehab or somebody that chronically was losing it before. But Olympic weightlifters right. aren't that. So um, I I wouldn't use that as a reason to not do it. That's a that's a post operative complication that would be bad for them. Right. I totally get that. But I don't I don't think that's something that should happen. And you know, hopefully we prevent. Right. So, um, you know, and, and I think, you know, an Olympic weightlifter, some of these other sports we talked about, javelin, even, um, uh, you know, tennis, uh, softball, because it's mostly position players like those types of things, like they just don't stress it as frequently as a baseball pitcher. Right. So baseball pitch is just valgus, 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 like over and over again. Right. So, so it's a little bit more, you know, demanding for that, that athlete. If you're just doing this, you know, here and there, right. Then, yeah. I mean, let it scar down, see if it works or do this type of thing. But I do think Dave's population throws us a bit of a curveball um, or a cartwheel, throws us a bit of a cartwheel. Um, did that work? But um, <laughs> to, uh, <you> know, <laughs> Courtney and I just you know, cringed you, internally. 
Uh, I mean, well, you were close, you but you threw, a slow, you threw a slow ball over the over the plate, so it didn't really get there. <laughs> okay, there <we> go. <laughs> so, I mean, if you're gonna throw a cartwheel at somebody, though, like I, it's it's the it's the tr- it's the traumatic the force generated through weight bearing with that amount of impact that does worry me a little bit. I'll be honest with you, but um, you know, so it, you know, but if the ligament's not torn in half and it's not like a huge dislocation type thing, then yeah, it's probably still a candidate to an extent. So. Um, well, hopefully that helps. If you deal with some of this patient population, you're going to be faced with this question. And oftentimes we talk to our patients before they get to the surgeon, right? And they're asking us questions like, you know, is, is this an option for me? Is this not an option for me? Um, I, I, I think the indications are expanding. And as we get to use this more and more, this is going to be refined over the years. But for now, I think this is a great start and, and it's great to have two options for these people. Like, like Mike said, like somebody that doesn't really want to commit to the 12 to 16 month like outcome, then this could be really good. So um, be sure to head to my other podcast, the, the Sport Physical Therapy Podcast. My episode with Jeff Dugas was great because he talks about a little bit of this too, from his perspective, from the surgical side, you can learn more about this procedure, but it's really neat. But anyway, really appreciate it. Great question. Thanks for asking. Uh, head to mikeronald.com, click on that podcast link if you have a question like that, and we'll be sure to answer. In the meantime, please rate, review, subscribe to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast, uh, so you can keep getting new episodes when we release them. Thanks so much. See you on the next episode.